Good afternoon. I'm Stefan Yost. I'm the Michael and Sonia Kerner Director and CEO of the Art Gallery of Ontario. And today I'm joined by Gaetan Verna, who is the Director of the Power Plant Contemporary Art Gallery here in Toronto. Um, we like to begin these, these conversations by acknowledging that we're on the traditional territory um, of the Mississauga of the New Credit, which has also been the home to the Huron, Wendat, and Haudenosaunee people through time. There's a lot going on at the AGO and AGO.ca. Uh, next week on May 28th, we're being joined by Matthew Teitelma, who is the director of the MFA Boston. The following week, ju uh, June 4th, we're uh, Franklin Simaras, the director of the Perez Miami Museum will be joining us. And on June 11th, Ann Pasternick, the director of the Brooklyn Museum uh, will be joining us. So four o'clock on Thursday, or if you wanna look at these later, you can do that as well. Um, today's talk and all these talks are sponsored by TD's Ready Commitment. So I wanna thank our sponsor and I wanna thank Gaetan for wearing TD Green today, because that, that just seems like a, a perfect match for us. Because this is Zoom, uh, we welcome questions. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk for 25, 30 minutes, and then uh, we will uh, take your questions. And so what somebody behind the screen, um, Annie and Kathleen will kind of take questions and, and send them to us to answer. So without further ado, let's just jump in here. And uh, Gaetan, welcome. And first of all, I wanna ask softball question. What are you most proud of uh, in the last years um, as director of the power plant. Oh, wow. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Stefan, for the invitation and hello to the public that is joining us. Um, and um, so what I'm the most proud of, I would say that I'm really proud of the team that I've built at the power plant and the type of uh, value um, and uh, vision and mission that we all strive to deliver all the time, you know, through our exhibitions and, and all of our program and the, the type of care that we, we as a team feel that the power plant is synonymous to, you know, um, and to me, um, caring, you know, this, this notion of caring starts with caring about the artists that we show, uh, caring about, about the patrons with whom we, we work. And then also I feel that you know, my, my board, uh, all the volunteers, everyone that is around the power plant, I feel there's this notion of care that for me makes it like a living place that's very human. Um, and that I feel that um, we, we all strive for, you know, being to being these types of humans that share these core values. Is that, is that core value of caring something that you've always had in every museum you've run or is that something that's developed with time? No, I would say I would say it's something. You know, I come from a family where my uh, my parents um, were born and raised in Haiti, and um, uh, my parents could have decided to not care about the plight of other people. And as young young uh, adults, they were heavily you know involved in um, wanting a change in their country. And unfortunately, they had to leave and be exiled and be in prison and all of this. So I've always felt very fortunate to uh, have had the type of life that I've had in Canada. So I always felt that the most I could do was to give back in some way. And so wh whether I worked in a small institution um, or midsize or at the power plant, I feel that that wherever, which, in whichever community that I find myself in, this notion of of, of caring and of, uh, of being a bridge between the community and artists is something that I really, uh, this is what drives me, you yeah. know, at the end, yeah. How did, how did your parents help you understand the importance of caring? Because that's compassion, caring is compassionate, but it's comforting, and it's not necessarily easy to transfer that. How I would say that? that my dad was a doctor, so, ah. Oh, this 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 dedication to others in terms of that type of work, um, and um, I think he was also a doctor that that uh, that was comfortable with the lab technicians and the cleaning people as well as the his fellow doctors. And I, sometimes I think more at ease with the, the regular folks than the other doctors. Um, and then my mom was a teacher, uh. and was the old fashioned type of teacher that when she went on holidays, she would buy postcards for her students and uh -huh. play music for the students and bake cakes. So there was always this, this, 
this wanting doing her job as a teacher over and beyond just the nine to five of teaching. So I think that's really from them that, um, that, you know, we, I've learned this, you know, this dedication to others is really important. How, how did you realize you wanted to be kind of in the contemporary art world? Was that something from a young age or is that something you bumped into later? Well, I would say that, you know, I, um, so I was raised in Montreal and um, I, I played uh, cello, classical music, and I danced ballet, and um, both of which I love doing, but I'm not an artist, you know, like I would practice cello just to, to have a good lesson, you know, not necessarily spend hours doing it, but I love the arts. And so at first I was really much more, um, you know, this is really a child mind. Uh, I used to, uh, to walk down the hill and, um, and the, um, the conductor of the Montreal Symphony Orchestra lived not far from my house. And I thought, oh, well, you know, maybe one day I could, uh, I could start working at the Montreal Symphony Orchestra and then I could work for the New York Philharmonic, you know. I'm <laughs> Why not? Go for it. <laughs> you know, I'll start small in Montreal and then I'll go to New York. Yeah. So I think that, uh, so the arts, a dedication to the arts and, and this notion that maybe artists don't always have the right in learning to, to make the risky business decision in order to promote art. So I wanted to be that person, that person that understands the value of art, but that can also take, make decisions, strategic decisions in order to be at the service of art. And then, um, uh, but then after when I, I started thinking of in which field I'd be more interested, the visual arts became really my calling, you know, okay. being in, in, in visual arts as, um, uh, as, a, as a field, but still having a great love for, you know, opera, music, theater, multidisciplinary practice. I like and to quip that, you know, if you were like, well, what do you like? I'm like, I like good art, right? And, and I'm quite broad at, at my taste. And often directors have very broad tastes. They, they just find things compelling. Yeah. Oh, yes, completely. You know, the human creativity and the creativity of artists is something I'm constantly in awe of, yeah. Yeah. you know? I, I should say, um, uh, um, my sister is a cellist, so she lives in New York and she is a cellist. So I grew up with, with a lot of Bach growing up, but she plays electric cello now and is, is much more hip and much more contemporary than, than I am. So if anybody wants to see her, go to Serena Yost, uh, I think .com or .org. She's, she's a, a fantastic, fantastic. Um, tell me at what point you realized, um, oh my gosh, this COVID thing is really, really serious and big. Were you quick on the uptake or were you just kind of doing your thing? Well, um, so early March, I had planned to go to visit um, uh, the Swiss artist Miriam Khan uh, mm -hmm. in Stampa Bregalia. So in the beautiful uh, uh, region of uh, the Grison Mountains that you very, know very well. I know very well. <laughs> And at first, so I had to debate because at the same time, there was the opening in Munich of a show of a, an artist that we had at the power plant in 2006, Franz Serral Walter. He was having a big opening at Haus der Kunst. I had contributed to the catalog and uh, the opening was around the same dates as my travel to Stampa Bregalia. Um, but I was told that I needed to keep my dates in Switzerland because they were having two days after my departure, they were going to have, um, what was it, 15,000 cross-country skiers coming in the, the, the Valais for a marathon. So I make my way there and as I arrive, then um, the bed and breakfast where I'm staying, they tell me, you know what, they've canceled everything. And then I started thinking, oh my God, like if the Swiss are canceling, this is really serious. Yeah. And so canceled the, the you know, the 15,000 uh, um, cross country skiers. And then during that time, so imagine we're March 5th, uh, between the 4th and the 7th, I was in Switzerland. And then they had al already canceled any groups of 10, of, of 100 people you couldn't gather. Yeah. So I started to realize that this was, was serious. 
And then also seeing people on the flight back from Zurich, you know, starting to wear masks or everybody cleaning, you know, all of their surroundings. You could feel the, the, the tension slowly moving up. Yeah. And then, you know, and then, uh, so for me, I was already then debating whether I could have caught, gotten it. But, you know, we weren't at the time of quarantining people. Um, but at that time in Germany, and uh, uh, I have friends in, uh, in Portugal, friends in France, they were already much yep. more advanced. So then I realized that this, this was getting really, really serious. But of course, like all of us, the day, you know, uh, of around the March 15th, 16th, 17th, yep. when everything shut down, I was like, yep. okay, this is That's very real. This is serious. Yeah, yeah, I, I uh, the reason we were smiling at each other when she mentioned Switzerland was uh, my parents are both from Graubünden or Grison, as, as the French say, uh, which is the eastern part of Switzerland. So I, I spent every summer there growing up and I'm still a citizen of Kloster. So um, so it's it's near and dear. Well, it's part of who I am. So it, it's, it's kind of a, you travel an extraordinary amount. Um, and you see the world and you're, you're um, very kind of active on the, the global scene. What, what drives you to travel? What makes you kind of think this is important to see? I think that in order to engage with an artist, you know, whether I, whether like as part of my job, I'm both, you know, our administrative director, artistic director of the institution. So I always feel that, you know, I need to pay my respect to artists. And before you even invite an artist to do a show, the notion of, you know, understanding their surroundings and doing a studio visit and actually meeting them um, in order to engage in a conversation well before an exhibition is, I think, something that is really important. And then, you know, um, though we can uh, read magazines and um, uh, magazines and look at internet and all of this, but there's nothing like being in a studio of an artist yeah. or in an artwork face to face and having the physical relationship to, to, uh, to the, the work of art. And for me, that's this, a yearning, a constant yearning. Yeah. And I feel that when I do that, I'm in a better position to defend the work of the artist, convince people, understand how, you know, um, how this work, wherever the artist is from, how this work can relate to Toronto and to the public in Toronto, because that's something for me uh, that is really important that I never forget where I am, like, you know, being um, at the power plant, which is the local, the, the, the uh, national and the global are different levels that I think we, I always try to think about when pairing Canadian artists together with international artists in conversation. And this yep. is something I feel is really important. And that can only happen by being in contact with artists um, and seeing the work, you know, face-to-face -face yeah. partnerships with colleagues. So that's... Um, I agree with you. I mean, I often, uh, well, in my past, I was very active in curating contemporary art exhibitions. And there is something about a studio visit that can be exhilarating when you actually see the work being created and kind of the, the ambiance, the feel, the energy. And one of the things I always tried to do is capture the energy of that studio and make sure it wasn't lost in the exhibition. Sometimes the process of exhibition making can kind of neutralize some of the passion, right? Or the protocols of museums. It, so how do you keep that sense of freshness in, in the exhibition? So um, yeah, it's it's hard thing to, to do. I love the power plants kind of um, commitment, both to Canadian artists, but also to a global conversation. I think that's, it's, a, it's incredibly important that we, we continue, continue doing that. Um, we, we're in a very diverse city. The diversity is growing. It's continuing to grow. What are, do you think some conversations or things we need to be thinking about now are so that we're well positioned in 10 or 20 years? Um, I would say the, 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 for me, something that I've, you know, the way I was raised by my dear parents is really that, you know, um, I believe in humanity, the goodness of human beings. And that, you know, everyone should be concerned about everyone else's plight. And a human problem is a problem that is a shared problem by all of us. And I think that, um, I think that this notion of, I'm very interested in breaking silos. And, 
explaining to people through the work of artists that some of the some of the questions that are maybe central to a certain group, you know, um, in our country are the same questions that are being asked by another group in another uh, part of the world, but that at the, you know, the end and be all is that we're all humans and that, you know, um, I don't want to put anyone in a box where an Indigenous curator can only be invited to reflect on an Indigenous artist, you know? Yeah. Um, so for me, this breaking of the silos and creating more open conversation and exchanges between people and between artists and between also disciplines is something that I think is really important. And in, in the, the, the question of diversity, that we always understand that, you know, as much as we think we know about others, we don't know about others. You, you know, until you've walked into somebody's shoes, you can, you can have a lot of misconceptions about them. And that I'm saying it from all sides, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think that, that for me, this expanding the scope, um, also in terms of the curators that I work with, you know, um, forcing them to curate shows of uh, artists that are not, you know, of the same race as they are, right expanding their understanding. And it's not only a question of race, is that if you have a specialty in Islamic art, you, you know, I'm gonna engage you in curating an artist that has nothing to do with Islamic art so that you also learn through that process and that you, you, um, you expand your horizon and that for the artist also, having the perspective of someone else looking yeah. at work and discussing it. So for me, this is something that I'm very passionate about uh, this notion of breaking the silos and opening. A, a couple of weeks ago, we had um, Glenn Lowry, who's uh, a MoMA on the conversation. And, and you realize like his background in traditional Islamic art, which is his area of expertise, actually has really allowed MoMA to broaden its lens significantly over 20 years or however long he's been there, 20 years-ish. Um, it's, it's that kind of the outsider view in one hand um, has helped MoMA, a kind of bastion of modernism and contemporary art, see broader than that. I, on that same note, I've been um, thinking a lot in the last eight weeks about artists um, uh, who were productive during the HIV AIDS crisis. Um, it's a pandemic. It impacted a community, the gay community, very hard. But artists like Felix Gonzalez Torres, um, who, you know, Cuban, American, extraordinary, extraordinary artists, um, but both rigorous, tough, but also there was joy in his work, right? And so, you know, kind of looking back at, at, at those artists to help frame the thinking about today, kind of that was. Yes. Um, before we were, we were um, here, uh, we went live, you were chatting a little bit about the cancellation of uh, your kid's summer camp. And um, tell us a little bit about kind of uh, your experience in summer camp. I think all of us on this beautiful day are thinking about going outside. Um, and tell us what that was like in terms of for you and for your kids and because um, it's such a Canadian thing. Yeah, well, my experience, I mean, the reason I speak English is because my mom, uh, who's a Francophone, when I was eight, she sent me off to summer camp. I think I only knew yes and no. And thus, I spent 10 days in a summer camp in Quebec. And, um, um, and then over the years, I've been to classical music camp, ballet camps. Um, but um, in my, um, when I was about 18, um, first I was a CIT at the YMC camp Uluwan in Quebec. And then uh, I went to, uh, when I was about 18, I worked at Camp Canawana, which is a YMCA camp. And I keep meeting so many Torontonians who have gone to Camp Canawana. But I must say, camp is a place where I've learned so much about working in teams, you know, and, and just that, that family spirit of camps. And so my kids, um, one is 14 and was dreaming of the last two years going on a 21-day canoe uh, trip. And we still don't know if it's going to happen. I feel it might not. And then my eldest one has been, you know, head of boating, uh, kayak, canoe and kayak at Camp Kanawana. So she was looking forward to spending yet another summer. And what breaks my heart in all of this is because of COVID, all these kids have been trapped with us. You know, it goes both ways. <laughs> They're trapped. <laughs> I think 
you know, if people think I'm a bad mother, it's fine, but I think they want to go away and we want them to go away also yeah. to live and be in an environment outside and being so happy and learning together. So that's why, you know, it's, it breaks my heart that camps are being canceled, but I, at the same time, we all understand why. Yeah, why. Sure, sure. It, that, that, that it, it is an interesting thing because um, a lot of Canadians have very kind of primary experiences being out in nature or doing a 21 day canoe trip. And I often think about how does that experience impact one's experience of looking at more traditional Canadian art, like the group of seven, right? That there's, um, that, that there's a deep kind of cultural understanding of, of many of those things, at least among certain groups. So um, we've got a bunch of questions actually here. We have um, some really great ones. Um, can you describe an encounter you've had with a gallery visitor that changed your perception of what you do and why you do it? Oh my God, <laughs> that's a question. I've got, I've got an extraordinary one. But yeah. Well, actually I do have one. So um, a few years ago, I was the director of Musée d'Art de Joliette and the mayor of uh, Joliette, um, you know, I think he was always suspicious of what we did at the museum. He supported the museum, but this was not necessarily, you know, his cup of tea but a very learned man, you know, he had a degree in philosophy and all of this. And one day uh, we showed the work of an artist from Colombia called Oswaldo Machia. And the, the, the work, uh, I forget the title of the work, but it was a series of these vessels in which you had different scents and the scents mixed together were talking about despair, you know? And the way this single experience of that work of art made the mayor of Joliette finally understand how important contemporary art was and how it changed his understanding of how it goes beyond, you know, the mere representation of, um, you know, a state of mind or et cetera, et cetera. It totally changed his whole way of defending the way, the way we were working. And then he said, you know, Verna, because you used to call me Verna, now I get it. I get what you're doing. <laughs> so that, when you guys write to us, it's always too long. So can you say it quickly, but I'm behind you, but you know, it's not just about, but that showed me yeah. the power of, of being able to transform somebody's vision and understanding of what they yeah. see in them immediately because of one work of an artist. So, I had this experience last year. So I take the TTC around town and streetcars in particular. We live in uh, Little Italy. Um, and I was on the streetcar and it, one of the old ones and a guy gets on who's clearly in pain, like clearly in pain in the back. Uh, his back hurt and he was leaning against it. And um, another guy said to him, you know, uh, Hey, you okay? Um, and the man said, yeah, you know, I got chronic back problems, et cetera, but I'm actually doing really well. And he's like, really? You look like you're in pain. And then the guy in pain said, yeah, well, I just went to this, the AGO and I saw this exhibition of works by this woman, Kathy Colwitz. And, you know, she lost her kid and it was just tough work. And I realized my life isn't that bad, right? That, you know, so I was just sitting there, you're hustling, but I thought, okay, you know, at least one person was, was, uh, was, um, was, was, was touched by, I mean, Kathy Colwitz is a fantastic artist. So, you know, these moments where you think, okay, uh, that's, 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 you're doing okay. something good. We're, we're doing something good here. We're doing something good. Um, somebody asked, uh, that they've got a BA in fine arts of history, art history. Uh, they want to become a museum director. How do you do it? What's your advice to them? Oh my God. Well, well, well. I always say to people, like when I think of, of where I'm at now, you know, if you would have told me, I would have never believed it. So it's, it's huh? like you, you start things because you, you really, uh, you start things because you really care about what you do. And I always tell people you have to be a self-starter. So um, I lived in Paris uh, for about eight years. And the first three years I was a resident at uh, the Maison des Etudiants Canadiens. So the international residency of students so that have houses of different countries. And uh, I remember with my friends, we started a group and uh, we were called DPA 
So discovered promotion art, and we did a, an exhibition. We went in studios, we got works of art, and then, you know, we, we exhibited the works, we sold them. I mean, I don't think we made any money, but that doesn't matter. And we had like different sashes that like we tried to, you know, wrote press releases and really did it. You know, you learn through doing it. And I would say, you know, there's, there's doing internships. There's, um, there's also, you know, um, you know, creating your own collective, finding spaces to do your craft and to start doing exhibition, you know, meeting artists, writing about artists that you're interested in. And, and, and I would say, you know, find every possible opportunity to gain that experience and to, um, to really own your craft. And the thing that I also think is important is that, of course, when you're in a big city like Toronto, you always think that the dream is, is working at the power plant or working at the AGO and the other spaces. But I also think that it's important to, to think that, you know, you don't, um, you do, my first institution was in Lennoxville, Quebec, you know, and then uh, I was in Joliet and then I'm at the power plant, but I couldn't have planned all of those this way, but every opportunity that I had to, um, to work in an institution, it was, I did it 300% and I took, I gave the same care working at Bishop's University as I did at Musée d'Art de Joliet, as I do at the power plant and never working, thinking that I'm doing this in order to get to the next stage. Um, so, so you, that's, I, you gotta go all in. And it's like, essentially you have to know art, you have to know people and you have to be committed to learning and helping people learn, right? That, um, and don't wait for somebody to provide an opportunity for you, um, create the opportunity, right? There's plenty of like, there's tons of opportunity. Like who are the really interesting artists today in Toronto who you think are interesting and how do you promote their work, right? Or who are the historic artists who are undiscovered and how do you promote their work and talk about it? There's so many artists that deserve to be written about, researched. Oh, uh, yeah. um, in Canada, there, there are research grants, you know, from Canada Council for different levels of, of curators. And I would say that, I, you know, uh, there's artist-run centers, there's, there's so many opportunities. It's tough, it's not easy, you know, that, that I would say to everyone, it is not for the faint of heart. But if you're dedicated, I mean, I remember I am um, the president of the board of TAC and I used to be the, the chair of the visual arts committee. And we received like a grant by a young group that was called Younger Than Beyonce. Yeah, I love it. Yes, the, yes. The How can you not fund them, right? <laughs> we were like, you know what? We like the title. <laughs> like what they're trying to do. It was a really good project. And we said, you know what, let's give them a chance. And they did amazing work, you know? Yes. We've got another question here. What's feeding you both in terms of art and wider culture at the moment during this time of an epidemic? Oh God, maybe, I don't know. I'm, uh, I don't know if it's like you for you, uh, like this for you, but I'm working even more than before yeah. because it's just like the days don't seem to end and, um, uh, talking, you know, on Zoom and meetings, um, it takes a lot of energy. So I feel that my days become more and more elastic. So I must admit, I watch a lot of TV after, and I'm very thankful that my team all have their all, I have lists and lists of TV shows that I can, I can watch in order to like, you know, like, kind of unwind and then put my focus in another area. So that's, that's been something. And then the other thing is I'm a great lover of graphic novels. So I've been reading graphic novels, you know, so between watching too much TV and a graphic novels and, um, and suddenly also I'm not baking, but everyone in my house is baking. Yeah. So it's, it's just like I, too much of I, eating. I have to confess, I've been a bread baker for quite a while, pre-COVID. So <laughs> I'm still breaking bread, but then it's not a, it's not a new thing uh, for me. Um, I must say, uh, like you, I'm, I, I'm often on 12 to 15 Zoom calls a day. I mean, it's, it's 
full on. Um, it's, it's, um, but I've also kind of nature still super important, right? You know, just slowing down and seeing your own backyard or the tree in your front yard and kind of trying to slow down at moments and breathe a little bit. So, uh, yeah. anyways, we got a uh, uh, remote access to exhibitions might be more common. Is the power pant looking for more immersive art experiences as part of future programming? Where are you going? That's, that's that question. So future programming or? Yeah, yeah that's, that, and is immersive art part of that? Well, one thing I must say is that since 2016, we always had what we called virtual tours of our exhibitions. And, um, and so um, to me, that was always something important because I realized that, uh, you know, sometimes you do things for one reason and then suddenly somebody stops you, an artist, uh, had written to me a note saying that they had um, challenges in mobility and that they wouldn't come down to the power plant during the winter, but they were thankful for our virtual tours because they could see our exhibitions in the winter. And suddenly, you know, I thought to myself, I never did this originally for that reason, but it suddenly, you know, really um, uh, created that, that opportunity. So in terms of, um, Right now, we're all hoping to to um, to go back uh, to, um, to the power plant. You know, we're making plans for July, for August, for October. Um, in the meantime, for you know, a staple of of the power plant is Powerball, which yeah. is, unfortunately there will not be a Powerball the way it is usually. So we've started this crazy campaign called Power Up and power up, you know, everything at the power plant is power. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so, <laughs> so when you, when you led with, I really care about caring. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, um, it's really something that we, you know, together with my team, my incredible team, um, we really came up with this campaign to try to say to people, First, we want people to know all these things about the power plant that they might not know because you never know the depth of what an institution does. Yeah. And I really, it feels like it warms my heart to hear people who engage with the power plant for, I don't know, our artist program or power youth or power kids, the artists, all these people rallying and saying, we love the power plant and this is why. Yeah. And please donate to this campaign to help us make it through this unprecedented yeah you know, um, um, a time. So, um, you know, um, my staff all wanted me to do a testimonial. I'm like, no, I don't need to speak. I love hearing all these people speak. And it really, it really, this is, it's like, it feels like it's a love letter of the city and of the people yeah. to the power plant. And so for me, that, that means, again, a lot. That means they care. And that means that we, we all we want to do is be back in our space yeah. together with the art, the artist, to, to, to keep, keep learning uh, together and, yeah. and exchanging, you know. But um, besides that, we're planning exhibitions. We had to shift some of our exhibitions in the fall. So we're going to keep the shows we had in the winter. We're going to keep them until, you know, the early part of September. Yep. Then um, after we're that... We're going to keep Arbus up and Illusions up till, you know... Yeah, because cause, cause they were up for two weeks and it, two week our best yeah. shows, you know, she's fantastic. No, that's it. And uh, I think like, I'm looking forward to that. You know, each time I'm phoning different colleagues going, oh, the show yeah. that I did, are you keeping it up? Because I yeah. really want to. I must say uh, the world, museum and gallery world has been unbelievably collaborative and really helpful. Because we all have, you know, for, for collecting institutions, we have, we have works all around the world that are orphaned. There's probably, you know, thousands of works and everybody's like no problem we've got it they're safe everything's good so it's kind of uh, uh, one of the things I tried to plug here is uh, if you want to support artists buy their art during this period um, oh. so if you want something beautiful at home to look at um, yes. buy something particularly for Ontario based artists it um, a $500 drawing $1,000 drawing can make a transformative difference, um, both in terms of money, if somebody's under stress financially and they're a great artist, and most of the artists are, but also just in terms of um, self-esteem and self-confidence. So um, it's 4.35, we're trying to wrap it up. So um, I, I do wanna thank you very, very much for 
for joining us in the, I don't know, 500 or 1,000 people who are online now. Any final words to people? Well, listen, everyone, art is, my heart beats for art. And uh, I think I speak for Stefan and everyone at the Power Plan and at AGO. We can't do this without everyone. And I think what every one of us wants is to be back in our institution with the public, yes. with artists. And, you know, my heart goes out to everyone because I still feel that we're the lucky ones, you know, in a certain sense. And that we just want, we want all of this to, you know, stop, but we can do it together. And thank you for this invitation. Sure. I feel, you know, we were all together and thank you for everyone that signed up. Thank you very much. Join us next Thursday. Matthew Teitelbaum at four o'clock will be here. We'll talk about the AGO and the MFA in Boston. Thank you very much for joining us. Have a great evening. Bye-bye.